Today's video is the first in the nuclear and particles topic, and we're going to start with the nuclear bit. And the first thing we need to know, and I'm assuming that you would know this, is atomic number and mass number. So we've met this a number of times before. We met it in nuclear radiation. You'll have met it at GCSE. The atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus, which in a neutral atom happens to match the number of electrons as well. But remember, it is not by itself the number of electrons. It's the protons and then the mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons. And of course, the mass number here will change depending on the isotope of the element. And an isotope is a version of an element that has a different mass number or more or fewer neutrons inside the nucleus. Sometimes you'll see the mass number being called the nucleon number. Both are entirely acceptable. Although our specification does call the atomic number the proton number and the mass number the nucleon number specifically, but both are included in there. Now we have a lot of information about the structure of the atom. And we've gotten that information with the development of science through the years. So the rest of this video is about the second of the specification points. In other words, how atomic structure has been developed over the years, or at least the knowledge of atomic structure has been developed. And we're going to start with an experiment that is called alpha scattering. And again, this is something that you met at GCSE, sometimes called Rutherford alpha scattering because of the scientists who use this technique to discover the structure of the atom. And the idea here is alpha. We know about alpha particles. We know they consist of two protons and two neutrons. So they're doubly positively charged. We also know they have an equivalent structure to the nucleus of helium. And the experimental setup was that alpha particles were fired at a very thin piece of gold foil. And a detector was placed on the other side. I'm just going to draw an eye as our detector for the moment. And on that screen, when the alpha particles collided with the screen, flashes of light were produced and those were counted. What you do need to know are the observations and the conclusions that went with these discoveries. So observation number one is that the vast majority of those alpha particles passed straight through the foil as if there was nothing there. The conclusion that was made from this is that there is in fact nothing there. Most of the atom is empty space. A small percentage of the alpha particles were deflected by less than 90 degrees they veered off to the left or right. The conclusion that was come to was that the nucleus was very positively charged and it was the repulsion between the positive alpha particles and the nucleus that was causing this change in direction. And also the number of particles gives you an idea of the size of the nucleus relative to the size of the atom. So if you look at the proportion or the percentage of the alpha particles that were deflected versus the percentage that went straight through, you could get an idea of where the field um, of the nucleus was. The final observation was this observation here. A very, very small percentage of them were deflected by greater than 90 degrees. And this allowed the researchers to conclude that the mass of the atom, most of the mass of the atom was concentrated in the nucleus because it takes a very large change in momentum. These alpha particles are traveling at about a million meters per second. And so in order to not just stop them, but actually reverse their direction in that manner, a very large force would be needed. So most of the mass is concentrated at the center. It also gave them a better idea of the size of the nucleus relative to the size of the atom and that most of the positive charge of the atom was also concentrated at the center. So these are the three conclusions that they came to, and from that they built up what they call the nuclear model of the atom, with your nucleus at the center and the electrons at the time orbiting around the nucleus. This alpha scattering experiment is an example of basically how science works. The fact that there were plenty of ideas about atoms, what they looked like, how they operated, and we're going to go through those in a moment because you need to appreciate the history of the study of the atom, but all of the advances that are made are made based on evidence. And that is the key point here. So the first in our characters, if you like, is the ancient Greek Democritus who postulated that if you take any material and you cut it in half and you cut the pieces in half and you keep cutting, eventually you end up with a fundamental building block of matter. And he called that fundamental building block atomos, which of course is where we get the word atom from. A lot of his work was forgotten and lost until the chemist John Dalton revived it in the early 18th century. 
and he started measuring the masses of various elements and figured out the atomic sizes from those. This was the forerunner of modern chemistry, the periodic table. The next character in our list is J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson is well known as the discoverer of the electron in 1897. And he belongs in this group because when he discovered the electron, he was the first person to find something that was smaller than the atom of hydrogen. And what that discovery told us was that there were particles smaller than the smallest atom. And he also discovered that individual atoms were made up of these particles. So for the first time, we weren't operating and assuming that atoms were whole spheres. The previous model, the Dalton and Democritus model, they call that the billiard ball model. And it's worked as a model because atoms often behaved like spheres when they collided in gases, etc. But this was the first time we realized that it had an internal structure. And now it's worth looking for a moment at the apparatus that J.J. Thompson used to discover the electron because it is part of one of the specification points for this video. This is a cathode ray tube. And cathode ray, ray tubes were still used up until very recently for TVs. Those older TVs that you see with a very large lump out the back of them, that large lump is a cathode ray tube. And what we see here is the heater right next to the cathode. Now the cathode, of course, is the negative end of the circuit in that this cathode ray tube is connected into. Electrons are released from the surface of this cathode by what is called thermionic emission. And as the name suggests, that is emission with heat. Very simple and straightforward. So when the electrons are emitted here, they are attracted towards the positive anode. And that attraction, that's a force is exerted on them, they accelerate. So electrons are accelerated by the electric field here. And we've got a second anode here, causing further acceleration of those electrons. These deflecting coils, these are coils through which there's a current, and of course those generate a magnetic field, and you use the magnetic field to deflect those electrons. We knew this already from our magnetic fields topic, we know that charged particles experience a force inside a magnetic field, and we have already derived in that the equation R is equal to mv over bq. If you don't know that derivation, then go back to the magnetic fields topic and have a look for it. This is very important when it comes to particle accelerators and particular particle detectors, which will be a future video because we are able to tell a lot about the properties of a particular particle, as we can see from the radius of its curvature through a magnetic field. So its mass, its velocity, its charge, all can be told from the radius in which it moves. So this was Thomson's apparatus. It was this that allowed him to discover the electron and its charge. After Thomson discovered this, they called the model of the atom the plum pudding model. So it was still basically a sphere, because like I said, the sphere shape works for a lot of the applications of atomic theory. But embedded within that sphere were the negative electrons that we now knew were part of the internal structure of the atom. The rest of the atom was made up of the plum pudding itself, a weakly positive dough. The next character, of course, is Ernest Rutherford, he of the alpha scattering experiment. And he was the one that removed this idea of the positive dough that the electrons were embedded in because as we've seen, his experiment demonstrated that the atom has a nucleus, a very dense, very strongly positively charged center that is much smaller than the diameter of the atom. Remember, all throughout this, what happens and how these ideas advance is based upon the evidence that is gathered and then the interpretation of that evidence. The final character is Niels Bohr, and Niels Bohr was the one who came up with the atomic levels for electrons so that they have different energy levels because with the nuclear model of Rutherford, the electrons were orbiting around the outside and that was not possible. They would have spiraled into the nucleus. So Niels Bohr came up with the idea of almost a ladder of energy levels at, in which the electron can sit. Now you don't need to remember the names of these characters, but you do need to know their models of the atom. So the this one is the Bohr model of the atom, that with the energy levels, the nuclear model of Rutherford, the plum pudding model of J.J. Thompson, and then the billiard ball model that was preceded those. 
and you also need to know the experiments that caused the development of that model over time.